And what I think is interesting about that as Christians is even though we can recognise that change and we recognise that in our society there's a new set of influences that are coming along, for us our influence stays the same. So Jesus lives right through all those decades. He's the same today, yesterday and tomorrow. He's going to be uh, always present with us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shock Absorber podcast uh, for another new season, which I'm very excited about. Um, we are sitting in front of the Green Combi for the very last time, I think, Stu, because we had it here for the conference that was on the weekend. Yes. Um, yeah. Are you looking forward to getting your um, your car back? Yeah, <laughs> it'd be good to be able to drive it around again. Yes, yeah. that is true. But yeah, the conference was terrific, and it was a really good opportunity to to hang out with people and to keep going deeper into some of these ideas. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. I didn't introduce you, by the way. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for <laughs> thank you for having me, Joel. It's <laughs> terrific <laughs> to be here. And we're joined again by Tim. How are you, mate? I've been going really well, thanks, Joel. Thanks are for having me on again. Really well. Uh really well. You're actually your 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 new um a new pet has arrived. Yeah, in your, in your house, and it's, it's, he's sitting just off camera and right next to you, right? That's right. Yeah, I've got little Moriarty with me. He's a little spoodle. Moriarty, what a name. Um, yeah, we got we've got two adult cats called Sherlock and Watson. So <laughs> we just thought we've if we get a dog, it's going to be the arch nemesis. So oh, um, wow. I think that is very true. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So uh, anyway, they're they're doing okay at the moment. They haven't had a lot of interaction, but they're checking each other out, and we haven't had any fights yet, so that's going well. So right. um, yeah, so he's going well, uh, and. Yeah, pretty. I'm not great with breeds though. What what breed is he? He is. It's called a spoodle. So he's part cocker spaniel, part poodle. Is that right? And the yeah. kids really excited. Uh, the kids love him. Excellent. Wife loves him. That's he's very cool. Well, we are here at season four of the Shock Resort, which is very exciting because we, in the in previous podcasts, we've talked about season one and two was the history of soul revival. Season three was, we were talking about, does the church have an image problem with youth? And right at the end of that, we talked about critiquing or embracing culture in the very last episode. So we thought that season four, then we can really get into that, and especially the 2010s that have really changed us. Um, and uh, you were just saying before we got on camera that it creates, there's been a lot of change in the 2010s and now even in the 2020s. Um, and it's created a lot of opportunities and also challenges in our discipleship and evangelism so we thought let's look at all the way up until today um, and look at the, how those changing culture the changes in those cultures have been affected by and the music that has come out of those times yeah. and also looking at that as a lens of how we can um, understand the culture for how we actually do church and all that kind of stuff but I think the thing that you wanted to look at as a resource to begin with was a YouTube channel that you recommended do you want to explain that yeah so as you were saying Joel the the, the interesting thing about the 2010s is heaps of us have been feeling like there's a change, like it's a, it's almost like the beginning of something new. And uh, the more we've been looking into it, the, the more other people are starting to talk about that. So in the 2010s, there's been a whole heap of new movements that have emerged. There's the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the environment movement uh, with uh, really focusing on climate change. Mm. And there's been the LGBTQ plus uh, movements that have emerged as well. And so the question for us, I suppose, as Christians is how do we uh, both engage with culture and how do we work out what to embrace and what to critique? And as we talked about last week, Ian Hussey has been really helpful to us in giving us uh, a bit of a framework so that we can think about how we as a church in got engage with culture. And like you said, it'd be fun to look at some of these big changes in our culture and, and do that through looking at some of the artists that have emerged in the 2010s as well. And so, yeah, the polyphonic uh, YouTube channel uh, that we've uh, been inspired by, I suppose, for this series is uh, produced by a Canadian uh, guy called Noah and he's an ex-music uh, journalist and he's got this really cool uh, YouTube channel. You should check it out, Polyphonic. does a really nice job of documenting oh, it's what's it's really cool. On. Yeah, I really like it. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's also really articulate and he, he takes different parts of music history and explores it. But what he decided to do recently was to do a whole series on 2010s and look at the 2010s through particular artists and how an artist shaped a particular part of, um, you know, the, or engage with some of these movements that have come along. And, and it might be a really fun way for us to look at the history of the last 10 years up to now through some of the artists that he looks at. And we thought, 
we could start off by looking at um, one of the artists he looks at, which is a surprising choice, actually. He looks at um, the 2010s through the lens of David Bowie in right. one of his articles, and that's kind of unusual because David Bowie is like from music past. So it m- might be a good place for us to start today by looking at David Bowie and seeing what contribution he made to the 2010s and how he rec- he, he sort of symbolises a transference of... Uh, a new period of time so he, he sort era of, of music new era of music he sort of celebrates the old rock stars the heroes of rock are kind of passing now and the, the baton's been passed on to the next generation of music artists and so there, there's also this feeling i think that we could explore through this series of you know the 2010s has kind of marked almost marked the end of one era and now we're looking at stepping into a new era what is that era what does it look like for us as christians mm-hmm. how do we engage with it and what has youth ministry got to offer in that new period uh, how does the shock absorber help us to engage with some of these big themes too so we could have a lot of fun with that i reckon yeah no, I, I, it's interesting how it like it's, some of the artists he talks about it like taylor swift and beyonce kendrick lamar so there's a lot of those artists that have started to shape culture differently to what perhaps david bowie has or, or was previously yeah and he's yeah. still still being part of it um there was the other resource that you've also you um i haven't actually seen it because i don't have subscription to apple tv but there's the 1971 documentary do you want to give us a quick yeah, brief on that apple tv is an, one of the streaming services that you can choose to watch or not choose to watch <laughs> and one of the one of the um apple uh documentaries that's on that is called 1971 and it's another influence for today's podcast because 1971 looks at how some of the themes i talked about earlier like the environment uh the gay rights movement the uh the feminist movement um different movements anti-war movements those were really um defined and expressed really clearly in 1971 again through a lot of the music of the artists in 1971 and the interesting thing about that documentary if you do choose to to have that streaming service and you want to watch that documentary is there's a really interesting episode on david bowie and how he starts out and what's really interesting for us today is the beginning of david bowie was around 1971 late 60s but in 1971 he really came to prominence with iggy stardust one of his characters that he constructed and you know he was part of that formative year that would be so influential through the next few decades and still today but also through black star which is his last album mm. that he released uh just before he passed in 2016 that's almost like a bookend to his life but also a bookend to an era and so what we're exploring theoretically today is that we've we've kind of got to move ourselves out of the the old era of rock and roll heroes and and all the music history that's gone before us and go into a new era but we've got to recognize too that some of those same themes from that past era are continuing to uh influence us today so it's a bit of a back to the future uh, kind of mm-hmm. podcast today um, had to get that 80s reference in because I'm a child of the 80s with the <laughs> Back to the Future movie but a Back to the Future is thinking about like we we can go back and have a look at David Bowie's life for us to understand what he sets up in the 2010s with his last two albums well, we're going to talk a lot about obviously we're going to talk a lot about cultural artifacts as mm-hmm. we as we go through this season um, you've mentioned Black Star there and we decided to make that our uh, cultural artifact that represents this episode um it's quite interesting that I'm a, I was doing a little bit of research on David Bowie before we recorded today, but he was at the time he was fighting liver cancer, so he was really facing his own mortality and really trying to understand like what had been part of his life. Because I think we were looking at it, he's um, recorded, he's influenced six decades of music, which mm. was pretty pretty insane. Um, Tim, are you a, a David Bowie fan, or is it just that you knew this was coming up and you're like, oh, I better listen to some David Bowie? <laughs> yeah, I know, I've done a fair bit of uh, catch up in the last few days since yeah. we pitched this as an idea. Um, what I noticed though was not being someone who would have been able to say, oh, I'm a David Bowie fan, or I, I can identify his music. I would just I just chucked on the Essentials playlist on iTunes, <laughs> um, and I was surprised by how much I knew. Yeah, um, and I go, oh, the, oh okay, I, c- I can see how iconic. He is because as someone who wouldn't have been able to tell you what one of his songs were, I could then listen and go, oh, yeah, no, he has influenced a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Um, Every track almost was something that I had heard, I had listened to, um, and I'm like, oh, okay, there we go. So being able to piece that together, being able to listen um, to different phases and different sounds as well, 
during that time. Um, and what, as you said, I really like about the idea of the Black Star record, um, and this is noted on the Polyphonics episode as well, but he, he is kind of writing his own eulogy, knowing that he's dying, um, but he's also recognising that, you know, this, this era is over, that he, he was one of these, you know, sort of founding fathers of that particular era of 60s and 70s rock and roll. The rock god myth, I think. The rock god them. myth they talk about, yeah. Uh, and they are, um, yeah, those who have survived up till now are now ageing out. Um, and so we are losing those stars. Um, and of course, you know, like with um, rock culture and pop culture, there, there are ones that we lost young along the way as well, which is an important part of that rock star myth. And the twenty, mm. the twenty seven club, of course. There's a lot yeah, of twenty seven club. Yeah, there's a lot of people that died in that. Uh, it's interesting relating that back to the rock god myth. I had a look at some of the things that happened in 1971, um, and well, have you linked me to a YouTube clip, um, Stu, about what the, some of the albums that were released in 1971. It's mm. quite a quite a list. It's amazing, actually. Not, yeah. So first of all, one of my favorite bands, Led Zeppelin Four. They released that was the the album they released then. But also, so David Bowie obviously had a, 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 a an album, Hunky Dory, released then. Carol King's Tapestry came out. Jethro Tull with Al- Aqualung, The Doors, L.A. Woman. Like there was just Rocky, um, sorry, Rolling Stones, Sticky Fingers. Like the list just goes on and on. Beatles Don McLean, Let It Be. Yeah, Beatles Let It Be. Like there was just so many amazing. Um, artists at that time so it's interesting how if we fast forward all the way until when black star released which apparently bowie died three weeks after it was released which is a very poignant moment to say this is the end of my career this is the end of what the rock god myth that we're talking about and then he passes away and that's Mm -hmm. what he's talking about so it's fascinating that that's it's fascinating that he recognised that and decided this is what I'm going to. But that was a story of uh, a lot of his life, right? He was always innovating, but also trying to represent the culture at that time. Was that would you you would agree with that or would disagree? Yeah, I think the interesting thing about David Bowie, particularly for some of our younger listeners and viewers, is that David Bowie uh, begins with this really sharp distinction in his style between what had been in the 60s with what he wanted to do in the 70s and he had this character Iggy Stardust Z- and Z- Ziggy Ziggy sorry yeah Ziggy Stardust so he was friends yeah. with Iggy Pop yeah Iggy Pop and <laughs> Ziggy Stardust but, but <laughs> Ziggy Stardust was this um, almost like larger than life character this um, uh, he was he was like an alien from another planet um, you know the 60s was all hippies and love peace and mung beans and all of a sudden Ziggy comes out with this like really red hair and flashy glam clothes and this brand new style style and like quite um, androgynous style yeah an andro- androgynous style which yeah. is another one of the things we'll look at uh with um as this series season goes on uh but yeah so he he comes out with this really new thing really uh and then but then straight away by 1975 he morphs again into the what, what did he call himself in 75? The White Duke, I think. Oh, he, the Thin White Duke. Thin White Duke, that's right. And he just goes into these really crazy, strange, right-wing political um, th- themes and, and occultic themes. Mm. And he's he's got this really strong period of drug taking and really into cocaine. I, I mean, apparently he was surviving on cocaine. What else was it? Oh, it was cocaine, peppers and milk. Cocaine, <laughs> peppers and milk. So he was... It's re- quite a diet, isn't it? It's <laughs> quite a diet, yeah, yeah. So... Um, he was he was really losing his way there for a while and then he he escapes from la and goes to berlin and he writes three albums mm. in berlin in the late 70s yeah, i think he wanted to get 80s. to try and break that cocaine yeah to get yeah. out of the break break yeah. that and then in the 80s he gets in a new wave and he's just changed again so even in the space of like a decade he's been able to morph himself into these three different personas and in part lead new breaks with the past and start new things within rock and roll but also in some ways he's reflecting what's happening in the culture too as rock and roll continues to morph and change and he was able to capture my generation in the 80s as much as he captured the early 70s generation uh, with his Ziggy Stardust his his, um, songs uh, from Changes which I think was around 1977 was really iconic in my generation and it was actually used in the uh, the opening scenes of The Breakfast Club, which was an iconic movie for my generation around 1985, I think it was, with Molly Ringwald. And it was this uh, movie, The Breakfast Club, was about a bunch of teenagers that are having to do detention together in a school detention thing. And 
um, basically it, it just explores teenage angst. It explores how the teenagers are all fighting with each other, but they're all trying to define themselves against the baby boomer generation, which are symbolised by their teacher who's um, from another decade. But interestingly in that movie, even though it's an 80s movie trying to define Generation X for the first time, uh, with a young group of people trying to define themselves against the parents' generation, which were the baby boomers, uh, they open the movie with a David Bowie quote, and he's a baby boomer, and and the quote is off changes. And mm. um, I might throw to our, uh, one of our but producers, the boys actually, on the, desk. On this, the boys on the desk, because they might be able to tell us exactly what the quote was. We might just quickly break to introduce these guys. We've got Dave and we've got Braden. Do you want to say hello, Dave? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> That's, cool. That's cool. And Braden. Hey guys, <laughs> yeah. how you doing? Yeah. Have, you got that, have you got that quote? Yeah, I do. So um, it starts with a quote from Changes, the song from the album Changes, as Stu said. <laughs> Lots of changes. Um, from the second verse, but it says, And these children that you spit on as they try to change their worlds are immune to your consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. Yeah, yeah. so that, that was really interesting because at the very beginning of the movie that quote comes up. And I remember watching the movie in the cinemas at the time, being really familiar with the song Changes, loving it, and then seeing that, and I was feeling like Bowie was talking directly to us, but really he was talking to his generation, and he's like a whole generation older than us. And there's this weird juxtaposition of these young people who are defining themselves against the baby boomers, but we're using a soundtrack from David Bowie to help us to connect with the movie. Mm. And so how successful was he at reinventing himself from being a baby boomer to now speaking to Generation X. As so that was what was phenomenal about his career, I think. Yeah, I just, um, as you're going through it, I'm just, I mean, I've never really been a David Bowie fan, but I'm coming, like, you've, you told us that we were going to look at David Bowie about a week ago, and I started looking, like, man, this guy's pretty interesting. Like, yeah. the, the fact that he was doing all those things, and then we have songs that I didn't even know, like Tim was saying, that would come and say, and I'm like, oh, I know that song. Like, I listened to the, I went to the Spotify list and said, uh, this is David Bowie playlist. I'm like, I know heaps of these songs like mm. the, the impact he's having on culture and maybe even perhaps you know like a, in almost in a, a hidden way is that is that it's so interesting that he can manage to make manage to make that happen over six decades like we said now having said that we are a christian podcast how does this relate to what we're trying to talk about in terms of christians engaging in culture um i know i feel like we're going to start linking to the homogeneous unit principle to, to a certain mm. degree because um, 1971, 72, when Ziggy Starker, Starker, Star, Stardust, there yep. we go. Ziggy yeah, that was Star and again, that was his character. If you're a bit confused by yeah. that introduction, he, he kind of created these characters that he... He, didn't man he had many. He like had many of them. So he didn't just play as David Bowie. He'd come on stage and was introduced as Ziggy Stardust. Yeah. And that was part of his shtick, if you like. Well, yeah. I even had a look at the list. I think I've got, hang on, one, two, three, four, five... Probably nine alter egos that he had. That's, like, which that's is, fascinating. Which is interesting. Do you want to like, go through them? What, what sort of ones? Yeah, so in 1969, there was Major Tom. Yep. 1972, 72 is Ziggy Stardust. Then 1975 is a Thin White Duke. Thin White Duke. And then after that, there's Aladdin Sane, Halloween Jack, The Soul Man, The Blind Prophet, Screaming Lord Byron, and per Perio or Perrier, something like that. So mm. he really is trying to... Why did why why would he feel the need to constantly change his character? Is my, he trying to reflect the culture? My theory is, I think what he's doing is he's recognizing that that youth culture actually morphs and changes about every five years, and so every new change in youth culture, he's created himself a new persona, and then he's actually able to speak in as a new person into that new culture. So this isn't David Bowie trying to refresh himself; he's actually changing into. He is the homogeneous unit principle. Oh, wow. Like he's actually been able to say from rock and roll, I'm going to actually keep changing as the culture changes and I'll stay relevant. But he also somehow influenced that culture as he did that. So mm -hmm. in 1971, that when the homogeneous unit principle was brought about by McGavin, who uh, for those of you who might be new to the podcast and haven't listened to early episodes, we have a whole heap of episodes on the homogeneous unit principle. But the idea generally is that our culture is made up of homogeneous units. And the best way to evangelize our culture and disciple our culture is for the church to to uh, separate up into homogeneous units and mission to those different cultures. So that was the impulse of uh, the Christians in the church growth movement in the early 1970s. At the same time, in a secular context, in popular rock and roll music, you get you get David Bowie who's actually recognizing the same thing. 
that there's homogeneous units in the culture and his approach is the same as McGavin's. I'm going to change as the culture changes. So McGavin would argue the church should change as the culture changes. So let's not keep running church services that were the same as 400 years ago. Let's make the contemporary service, the contemporary church service with contemporary church music. Those words came into our regular parlance in the early 1970s and it was the same impulse that David Bowie had. So one of the fascinating things about David Bowie is we can at once look at culture changing through his career, but we can also see a shadow, I suppose, of what the church is trying to do and I would argue probably not as successfully as David Bowie because he was able to continue to succeed through that. But what he was able to do, which sometimes is different to the homogeneous unit principle, is I think in the church we watch culture and then we try and copy it. So there's always a lag, a delay. Mm -hmm. The culture changes and then we try and catch up to culture. But David Bowie was different. He was noticing the end of a culture and then imagining what could come next, creating that, and then the culture kind of also went along with that. Yeah. So an interesting example of that is in the 1990s, he was, uh, he was interviewed by Rolling Stone magazine. And Rolling Stone said, you know, this is like now, what, 30 years after he began, something like that. And they've said, you know, as one of the rock heroes of rock and roll, uh, if you started today, what would you recommend to the teenagers? What sort of instrument would you learn if you started today? Would you learn piano? Would you learn drums? Would you learn guitar? I mean, this was in the middle of the grunge era by this time with Kurt Cobain and Nirvana, who also were fascinated with Bowie and actually did a whole record um, of his songs. But basically, I said to Bowie, what would you do today in the 1990s? He said, what, you know, what instrument would you play? And he surprised the journalist by saying, I actually wouldn't play an instrument. I'd pick up a computer keyboard because the era of rock and roll is over and now the cultural influences are going to be people who use the internet. And he said, look at Steve Jobs and Apple, that's the future. So this is the kind of difference between David Bowie and the homogeneous unit principle. He wasn't just changing himself to copy culture and then be successful in this new era. He was actually going, I'm looking forward and seeing that rock and roll is not going to have the influence that it used to have in my younger days. And by Black Star, you actually get this, it's almost like this eulogy of, not only his life, but also that era of rock and roll that has finally come to the to the end after he predicted that in 1990s. It is fully now. I mean, there is still music and we're going to celebrate the role of well, music today and look at cultural change through music. But um, it's, new, it's a new era. And I think, I think his, his death sort of is a, is a baton change. I think it's super, generation. Well, super prescient because I think it's very true because now the biggest artists in the world are individuals. Mm. We talked about Taylor Swift, Kendrick Lamar. It's really interesting. Um, even Jay Z, like a lot of hip hop artists, and they're all the biggest artists. Uh, Beyonce, of course. They're all the the, the most. They're ne never big bands anymore. Like you still got U two, mm. perhaps, or uh, the Rolling Stones, ACDC, all that kind of stuff. But like they're again a bygone era, right? The new mm. era is the biggest artists are individuals, like mm. Kanye West, for example. Um, is that again, that's that's something that we've talked about with the homogeneous unit principle that start that began from the youth quake is the rise of individualism, mm. um, and I thought that would be an interesting way to move forward. Is that like, well, it looks like David Bowie was actually a, an example of that. If he's going to create all the characters that he wants, and I'm going to be this, and I'm going to be that, mm. it's, it's pro possibly reflecting that individualism in the culture mm. as well. Um, that's something that we talk about in terms of the shock absorber. Is that we would rather move away from the individualism, the transience and consumerism of church. Can we start getting into that a little bit? Um, how can we start fighting that individualism and why is it important that we recognise it? What do you mm. reckon, Tim? Do you want to go first? No? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry, you don't, you don't yeah, look that no, excited. That's right. <laughs> um, Deep in thought. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as you say, like um, David Bowie is uh, representing this really hyper individualism. Um, and being able to create his own sense of self. Um, maybe another thread we can sort of hold on to maybe for later is the, I find really interesting the, the performance art yeah. aspect of that. Um, and one of the comments particularly, I know there's another Polyphonics episode on the Thin White Man, uh, sorry, Thin White Duke, mm. um, uh, and just quite a destructive character. And the question is how much of that was pure performance, how much of it was actually him um another artist similar time who's had a long span alice cooper um you know alice cooper 
the artist is actually a persona. It's, it's not um, a Vincent Furnier uh, <laughs> is the guy's name. And so there's this, there's this character on stage and, it's, and he's gone through different performance artist type ways of expressing this character who is not what he is like. Uh, and so that, I find that really interesting. But this idea of constructing your own identity is really fascinating and this individualism. Uh, and so, yeah, so we bring, bring it into um, Hussey's uh, dynamic here of thinking what do we um, hold on to, what do we critique in culture. Um, we're yeah, noticing that there is a, uh, an individual part of what it means to be a Christian. Um, and so uh, Paul in Romans 10, yeah, he talks about uh, if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved as with your heart that you believe and are justified. There is a, we, we, it, there's a personal nature to this. Uh, I need to decide for myself. I can't be a Christian by osmosis. Um, there, there's a classic saying, you know, there are no Christian grandchildren. You know, you, you're not <laughs> Christian because you've been born into a family or anything like that. There is, you must have that personal aspect to it. Um, and yeah, just a few paragraphs later when we get to Romans 12, Paul's also talking about the communal aspect of this, that actually belong to one another. Um, and so in Romans 12, as well as in um, 1 Corinthians, he talks about this image of the body. Um, and so uh, just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Um, and so part of the hyper-individualism that we would want to critique is one that says, uh, you know, I can define myself completely external to any other influence in any other person. Um, in fact, the, the um, common thread throughout the Bible is actually it's God is the one who defines me. Um, and there's a certain freedom that comes from knowing who I am as a child of God. There's a, that's a designation that's put upon me by someone else through adoption. Um, and yet there's also that re personal responsibility. So that's going to be part of our interaction with these ideas is that we can say, yeah, there is an individual personalised aspect to the gospel, um, but a, sort of a hyper-individualism can damage the gospel and damage our understanding of what it means to be a Christian as well if we're not also holding on to that body idea. We belong to each other. I'm not my own. I'm there for the sake of the other Christians. Um, and that comes into... Um, our expression as church and family and household and all those things that we've talked about over the last couple of seasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned Ian Hussey there. Um, Stu, you've been reading him a lot lately. Uh, do you want to give us a, uh, an outlook on how he likes to talk about embracing culture or um, perhaps just critiquing it? Yeah, well, Hussey, Hussey has used some uh, paradigms that other people have developed, but he basically looks at what he calls cultural dimensions. And then he focuses on those dimensions to try and look for what he calls some scale anchors you know if right. that's that's a bit um esoteric uh, to make that a bit more concrete what he says is that every culture uh has certain themes that help us understand the culture so he doesn't want to stereotype a culture but he also is looking for common themes to help us to understand a culture which i think is really interesting so some of the areas he goes through is um He's actually developed five areas and the five areas are you get to understand a culture as you look at its relationship with the environment, both natural and social. You get to understand a culture when you look at its social organisation. The third thing you can understand a culture through is its power distribution. And then you can also understand a culture a little bit if, as you look at how they uh, understand rules. Are rules... Um, you know, are they a real law kind of abiding rule based society or a relationship based society? And then the last one is how do you understand a society based on how they see tasks? Uh, for example, some cultures are really task based and task focused, and others are more relational. So he, he looks at each of those things and his anchors or his scale anchors for each of those five things are these. Some societies seek mastery over the world and some cultures seek harmony with the world so uh, aboriginal culture in australia would, would be looking to live in harmony with the environment whereas uh, the british when they came to australia were looking for mastery over the environment that's the difference between those two cultures likewise with social organization some societies are more individualistic and some societies are more collectivist again the the uh 
the European Western culture is more individualistic as um, has become more and more so as we can see as we looked at um, David Bowie as he was very individualistic but other cultures are more collectivist so again if you look at an Aboriginal culture framework it's more of a family orientated uh, context rather than just being an individual the third one some societies are quite hierarchical who's in charge who's not in charge and some are more egalitarian we're all doing this together and fourthly some societies are more rule based versus relationship based so some people it's like tell me what the rule is and I'll obey it and some people are like well I'll think about my ethical decisions based on how it will impact my relationships with other people and so the last one is uh, I'm going to relate to people based on whether they can help me get tasks done or I'm going to relate to people just because I'm going to relate to people so so that's really helpful and and if we look at uh, Hussey's dynamic there with uh, regard to I suppose the last I don't know 40 or 50 years of rock and roll and popular culture it's yeah we've been saying it's becoming more individualistic as as the decades have gone on and less collectivist so it's really embracing and celebrating the individualism of our society and and so uh, individual individualism is a real person-centered approach where the primary loyalty someone has is to themselves um, their preference is pr for preserving individual rights over social harmony. Belief that people achieve self-identity through individual accomplishment. And they focus on accomplishing individual goals rather than group goals. Uh, sanctions reinforce independence and personal responsibility. So the idea of any rules is that the, the rule should reinforce independence so if we're going to make a rule let's make it to reinforce the independence of the individual uh, and their personal responsibility uh, contract-based agreements are really important in an individualistic society so this whole litigious society that we've developed around ourselves where people sue each other to force them to comply with what is right is apparently part of an individualistic society and there's a tendency between uh, towards um uh, communication being quite direct and frank according to Hussey so uh, in a collectivist society there's a lot more negotiation in conversation I think it's interesting with the rise of social media you see that frankness as one of the the real defining factors of social media where people just come out and say sometimes really aggressive mean things to each other according to Hussey that's a byproduct of our individualism where we're not as concerned as for the collective good of the whole we're more interested in our particular view uh, and others need to hear our view uh, there's a tendency towards individual decision making now if you look at Bowie through the eras yes he has had all these different manifestations of himself but each of them have been very individualistic and so he he hasn't really focused on being part of a band or part of you know a, a a tribe in that sense he's created tribes he's created images that other people have defined themselves against so for for us as christians i suppose uh, as tim you were saying like the bible authors are encouraging us towards individual responsibility particularly to understand that god has made us as an individual in the image of god and that we are called upon to be humble and to take responsibility for the wrong things that we do individually that we don't just look out there and go all the wrong in society has been created by our culture or by other people i have to take individual responsibility for what i've done wrong as well but having said that there's also this uh explanation in in the bible about how we are a collective as well so when you look at ephesians which is one of paul's great discussions on the gospel he he spends the first half of Ephesians describing what a difference Jesus makes, how Jesus reconciles us to God and reconciles us to each other through his death on the cross and rising to new life, that if we put our faith in him, we can repent of our individual sin and be individually saved. And that means we have an individual relationship with God and an individual relationship with our brothers and sisters. And the second half of Ephesians, he unpacks that and looks at all the different metaphors that you can use to describe that new reality of being part of god's people which is we're part of a family we're like a house being built together um, with jesus as the cornerstone there's all this terrific imagery to help us to understand it, the collectivist nature of the gospel as well so um, 
by purely just diving into an expression of church that embraces individualism, if we're not careful, the homogeneous unit approach may embrace individualism so much that we might lose some of that collectivist impulse. And, you know, in a collectivist mindset, these are some of the themes that you might have, if I could just share those, Joel. Yeah. Things like, if, if you're thinking more collectivist, uh, you have a group-centred approach that's valued, uh, your primary loyalty is to the group, uh, there's a preference for preserving social harmony over individual rights, which is really interesting. Uh, so in collectivist cultures like Aboriginal culture, there's a sense where there's a belief that people achieve self-identity through group, group membership, uh, which is very different to the David Bowie uh, thing we're looking at. There's a focus on accomplishing group goals. There's sanctions to reinforce community goals. There's sanctions to reinforce group norms. Um, I remember being at university in the 1980s and one of my lecturers was describing this to us by looking at the difference between an African village and living in the city of Sydney, where we live. And this lady was saying that she uh, went and lived with a, an African community for a while in, uh, in, a, in a village. And she said what she noticed was all the adults in the village reinforced the same values. So if a child said to their parent, I don't want to do what you want me to do, one of the aunties or uncles would say, well, we, we all do that. So there was this call to a collective approach, which we kind of don't have in an individualistic society. Uh, really interestingly, that collectivist mindset calls for relationship-based agreements rather than just litigious agreements where you sue people. And there's a tendency between uh, more there's a tendency towards rather more subtle indirect communication that's more polite. And I mean, I suppose one of the shadows of that is that sometimes people don't say what they think, but there's this sense that what I think might impact you and I might shame you. So I don't want to shame you publicly by what I say. Whereas in an individualistic society, people don't care about that as much. Especially well, they do, but social not as media. Much. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a tendency between group and participate participatory <laughs> decision making. So people decide things together. So. I think you get some of those themes also in the biblical writers. So while the biblical writers would not call on people to lose their individual uh, sense of self in the midst of that collectivist uh, kind of context, there is a an embracing of that in the New Testament as well. I don't know what you think, Tim, but that's some of the things I'm thinking about. That. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are certain... Uh, in part of the cultural nature of the the ancient world in the first century um, was more collectivist than it was individual mm. so mm. we would expect some of that to just naturally come out of the way because that was the worldview that was the thinking of the biblical writers but we can also see in their imperatives what they ask ask us to do as christians we can see some of those um, collectivist ideas i was thinking you made the comment joel that um you know we don't see a lot of this collectivism uh, on social media, actually, we see a huge amount of this on social media when we get behind, you know, hashtags yeah. um, and you know, the, causes and the tribalism like that. that can yeah, often yeah. come that's as well. So, um, so there's, yeah, the, it's a, that's an interesting um, uh, development, I suppose, yeah. in our culture as well. Is that I, when I'm on social media, I have this individualistic tendency to create for myself. Um, an identity and I get to be Bowie. I get to be the one who puts myself out there. A and following. And, and get, get a following, um, try and, you know, individualise myself. I am this person. Um, and yet there's also a tendency that I want to be seen as part of a group. So whenever I use uh, a hashtag, um, you know, the as you said, some of these cultural trends have come out of hashtags. So if I hashtag Black Lives Matter, if I hashtag uh, Me Too or Church Too or any of these kinds of things, I'm also um, submitting myself to that group uh, and I'm also wanting to take all of their cultural um, dominance and power and storytelling onto my own persona as well. So there is this idea, um, I was struck by the this one here that... Um, that people achieve self-identity through group membership uh, and that that can be really striking you know in terms of uh, i identify as this group identity uh, i identify with this particular um, uh, ethnicity or racial or skin color or whatever it is like we, we have these identities that are actually group reinforcing um, and so we see the this this tension playing out in that space as well how does jesus identity in jesus how do we take membership 
of that rather than finding other groups for us to be part of? Like, why is it so important to make Jesus the central identity for us? Well, it's interesting you should ask that question because uh, an author called Miroslav Volf in the late 90s started to explore some of this kind of stuff and he was looking at identity and his, he wrote a book called Exclusion and Embrace. And in that book, he talks about the fact that as Christians, we have multiple identities. So I am a, a man, I'm Anglo, I'm from the Sutherland Shire, uh, I, am, I like soccer, I like surfing. They're all parts of my identity. But what's really interesting about Wolf is he says that that I'm also a Christian and that's the centre of my identity. So I need, it, I need to understand that the cross actually influences and shapes all of my identities. So I can embrace otherness in other people through the cross. So I don't only just uh, embrace sameness, I need to embrace difference. So I think what's interesting from what you're saying, Tim, like, David Bowie was almost like a prototype social influencer. <laughs> so, you know, so the social influencers are saying, I'm, I'm a hyper individual and I want you to listen to me and be just like me. And then everyone wants to be like that person. I think that's a good summary for Bowie. So I think the answer to your question is try and resist the urge to get my identity from following a social influencer and rather get my identity from Christ. And, and sure, I might like the the makeup or the lipstick that that social influencer uses and I might find it fun to do the sport that the social influencer does or go on the holidays or whatever it might be but but I actually need to remember that I'm a Christian first and everything else second. I think that's really helpful and that means that I'm willing to critique and embrace parts of the culture that happen and I think if you come back to the 2010s for David Bowie's work you see an interesting trend. He's He's facing his own mortality. He produces two records in the 2010s, The Next Day and Black Star. In The Next Day, he's starting to try and come to terms with the fact that the age of the mythic rock gods is over. So the old school of influences is over and there's a new time of influences that's about to begin. And it's interesting that he puts that album out and the uh, artwork on that album is really interesting because uh, he collaborates with oh what's the name of the artist he collaborates with jonathan Ban barnbrook i think barnbrook, his name think, is yeah. and he collaborates with this way of doing the the first of his two albums in the 2010s by putting a white square with the title of the album on top of an iconic album from the past so mm. we've already mentioned heroes from 1977 so he takes that which is probably one of his most iconic album covers and he just puts a square over the top of it so he he kind of defaces it with this square and he's saying in this new album in the 2010s, I'm not trying to be nostalgic. I'm not trying to go back to the past. I'm actually recognising I'm coming to an end. And I'm just signalling to you that so is my generation and our influence. And there's a new influence coming. And what I think is interesting about that as Christians is even though we can recognise that change and we recognise that in our society there's a new set of influences that are coming along, for us our influence stays the same. So Jesus lives right through all those decades. He's the same today, yesterday and tomorrow. He's going to be uh, always present with us. Um, but at the time of writing, you know, the 2010s, we lost a lot of the icons of Bowie's generation, not only Bowie himself, but also Malcolm Young, Chuck Berry, Aretha Franklin, Tom Petty, Lou Reed, Keith Emerson, all these great artists and heroes, mythic rock gods have all been starting to pass away in the 2010s so that by the time you get to black star which is 2016 bowie's got literally he's got liver cancer he's facing his own mortality and i don't know what you guys think about it but it's almost like not only an eulogy for himself and his career but a eulogy for that generation mm. and there's a passing on and looking forward so actually on Rockstar. oh sorry on uh black, black star. star there's a song called dollar days where he sort of wants to relive those days where he was at the height of his influence and he's trying one last time to do something that's going to grab everyone's attention. Mm. It's almost like this instinct for individualism is I need to go out as an individual and I need everyone to recognise that I'm going to go. And the last song on the album, he actually sings, I'm trying to and I'm dying to. So he's, he's literally kind of dying at the end of the album. And what did you say, Joel? It comes out like three weeks I think he he died three he weeks, three weeks later. later. It's yeah. almost like crazy timing because he literally was dying as the album came out. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know what you guys think about that, but I think those two albums are quite 
sad because it's sort mm. of like the death of individualism. It doesn't get you to endu- have enduring fame. He's sort of recognizing that on Black Star that you know I'm just going to fade away. I'm gone, and new people are going to take over. So I was kind of like this question: like, what was all that for? Like, what was the worth of being a star if your star ends up going black, going black, and fading, and black representing death? Mm. Uh, like the lights going out, and um, yeah. So, so I think the thing about the Christian faith that we have, that we will always have, is hope, hope for the future. But it's not based on our own individual performance and our own identity and our own success. But it's about us being connected to Jesus because he alone has overcome death. And even though he died, he rose again from the dead. So I find the Christian gospel incredibly powerful in our generation as I think lots of people are going to try as hard as they can to be an individual and be successful. But then there's this moment where you, 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 you're going to recognize the mortality of your life and that even though... David Bowie was a mythical character and was able to leap from the baby boomers to the Gen Xs and he understood the change in technology to the computer generation which will attract the the next two generations and the millennials and the generation Z and all this but he wasn't able to go beyond that because he had a you know he had a certain number of days on this earth finite time finite time and Jesus says look um, I am the way to the father in John 14 uh, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't say this. I go to prepare a place for you. So this is incredible promise in Christianity that I think uh, is really powerful amongst an individualistic generation that has a limited uh, scale where we have an unlimited scale of eternity. Yeah. But, um, using David Bowie as a, a quite an interesting picture of almost of the homogeneous unit principle, Bowie created a lot of characters um, and to perhaps reflect the culture, but also try and move the culture forward. Um, but he also killed off those characters. That's interesting. Do yeah. we do we need to kill off the way we do church? Wow, that's that's a big question. What do you think, Tim? Uh, According to the culture, would be my end of my question. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, there are going to be times. I th- what he's doing is because he has so attached himself. To that particular culture, um, it's necessary then for him to kill off that character in order to move forward. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and you can think of other musical artists, perhaps, and other bands that, um, for the sake of sticking with their authentic style, have therefore not lasted more than five, mm. maybe ten years at best. They're like bands that have longevity are those that are able to progress. Um, I mean, say, except, except for ACDC. Except for ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going. Um, but in, certainly at the, the sort of, I mean, the pop level, like pop is, you know, by definition, it's, it's, it's what is popular. making the most money. It's, it's, it's the yeah. most popular. And yeah. so you've got bands, uh, you know, you, you've got the ACDCs, you've got other rock and roll bands, you've got all sort of niche um genres that will stick with their style and the the diehard fans will be like oh yeah i'm, I'm going to buy the next whatever album um because i really like their style and i know it's niche it's not going to be in the top 40 this week even if it was in the top 40 25 years ago um but yeah you know, you've got david bowie i mean madonna would be another one who's got this incredibly long track record and constantly trying to reinvent style image etc paul mccartney with mccartney three that's just become number one but that's it you know like he's come out with that album yes yeah yeah so those reinventions and because it is tied so closely to culture you need to be able to kill off that old one um the question about the church is an interesting one um in terms of if we do go through and it's sort of an incarnational uh, model of church where we are seeking to reflect culture and we're trying to impress culture or to be where culture is, uh, then it is going to be necessary to continue to reinvent ourselves in our church. Uh, we're going to have to, um, you know, repaint, refurnish. We're going to have to change the musical style. We're going to have to think critically about, okay, we, we used to say we were into this, but now we're going to move into this because culture is shifting and we want to be both responding to and at the forefront and engaging. And because you're being driven by culture, um, now, you know, Jesus Christ is, is Lord of his church and the church has withstood all sorts of cultures. 
Um, and it's all across the world. There is no particular culture of church. Um, you know, you, you go through church history, even just right now, 2021, you go all around the world, you'll see lots of different ways in which people express the gospel. So there's a certain sense where there is no church culture because uh, you know, it's, it's designed by, you know, by God to actually be able to adapt to wherever you are in the world, wherever the language is, whatever the cultures are, whatever, you know, all those kinds of bits and pieces. Um, but that's different to say like within a particular cultural context, whether it's Western context or anywhere else, trying to chase where that culture is going. And so there's going to be ways in which we actually um, don't just embrace culture, but we're actually critiquing it as well. And I think that will give us um, the authenticity to be able to continue on um, into the future and to not have to kill off a particular style of church, but actually just be able to continue thinking about how do we continue to be God's people in this particular moment. But when our defining factor is what does Christ want us to be doing in this moment rather than what is the culture doing in this moment and trying to mirror that, um, then that's going to have that authenticity of, you know, we're actually being God's kingdom people in this particular moment. I love what you said last episode is that the metric is the main metric that we should look at is faithfulness. That's right. To be able to influence everything rather than the other way around. Because I was also just thinking when you were saying what you were saying just then is that if we are changing church according to the culture, is that at odds with the identity, our Christian identity that Jesus gives us? Well, according to Hussey, sometimes it can be, sometimes it's not. Okay. So I think sometimes we adjust the culture and it's fine to, to have different, you know, have chairs instead of pews in the church or maybe the, in the Anglican church, ministers don't wear robes anymore. That's a cultural mm. icon from the past that we don't have to copy. But if we put the Bible as our key authority, then we do have traditions from the past that we can bring with us because Christian, many generations of Christians have tried to work out how to... Uh, to uh, express the the biblical values in their culture and they've come up with some really good lessons there's some really good things to do but so we don't want to get rid of all tradition but we also understand that in our culture we don't want to just embrace it all as well mm. and that's why i like the shock absorber and i like intergenerational ministry because rather than trying to change our approach every time culture changes we actually change the conversation every time culture changes and so we have uh, this approach where we're a family and when there's a cultural change we get together as a family and we sit down and we talk about it together and we can talk about some more of those moments in future episodes but um, I think I think it'd be interesting if maybe Braden could find some of the words on that that last song on the the Black Star album because you know to contrast the um, just the sad eulogy that um, David Bowie has there with how the biblical writers talk about Jesus. There's this sense that it's not that it's gone and it's in the past and and now someone else will take over and the baton's been passed on. There's a sense that Jesus is is still alive and he's with us. And he himself said, I don't leave you as orphans, I'll send the counsellor to be with you, the Holy Spirit. And so when we become a Christian individually, we all receive the Holy Spirit who lives in us individually. And so our nature is changed individually from that of just being a sinner to being a spiritual person because of our connection with this Christ who is alive. And so there's this celebration and this hope and a looking to the future. And it's, and there is a recognition in the scriptures of the now not yet tension we live in, that this world is fallen and there's so many sad things and so many problems. But in the Jesus-shaped community that uh, we've been given by Christ as he has reconciled us to one another, we have this opportunity to live out uh, both an individualism and a collectivism at the same time, if you like, that is, that is not defined by human ideas but by, by, by God himself who says, I created you, I know how you work best and I've got this plan for your life. And so we've got the scriptures and we have everything there we need to understand how we can live a fulfilling life and... We have everything we need in Christ to to thrive as Christians. We're not perfect, but we are sanctifying. In other words, we're growing and changing and, and we're becoming different all the time too. So the really interesting thing is that Ziggy Stardust morphed into the thin white duke because David Bowie decided he needed to make a change to stay up with culture, whereas we are changing because the Holy Spirit is 
changing us to be more like Jesus as we read the Bible and we work together and serve and love one another. And it's interesting in uh, Philippians, you see that played out, that we're meant to emulate Christ and emulate him in his humility. And then in 1 Peter, Peter talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit himself is changing us to be like Christ. So there is a change and there is a redefinition all the time as individuals and we can keep uh, growing and changing because of Christ. So I think I think that for me means that when it comes to the expression of church, the question you asked, it's I do think what we need to do is build a bridge to the new reality before we... We we don't just do like Ziggy Stardust, start Ziggy Stardust, completely to, to, yeah, to yeah. completely kill off the last thing and then move to the next yeah. thing. I think we're just in a in a natural evolution of change as a church. We're just growing and changing as we have more voices from different generations. We're interacting with different technologies. There are different movements that are coming along, giving us new challenges and opportunities with the different themes that they're bringing up in the context of our broader society and as a church we need to to go right let's not kill off the early morning service where our elders have been meeting together in that expression for 70 years let's let's do something new but keep it connected to the past so that Mm. um if these new things we do don't work we can come back Braden, how'd you go with that lyric from that black star record yeah i found um plenty of stuff there but i thought an interesting thing just to say about um what you're saying about we don't have to kill off the um, the traditional service. I think that that is an important thing because yes, David Bowie changed, but he didn't delete their albums. He didn't That's completely yeah. remove That's their really albums that he made before. So you've got you've still got people who maybe didn't like stuff that he made later and weren't that into it, but they could still go back to the things that they did appreciate. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Um, Yes, moving and changing on, but also preserving things that people cherish and love mm. um, uh, is an interesting, I think, thing that I'm sure is going to come up a little bit and we can look at as we go forward. I think the just looking at the the lyrics to some of the um, Black Star album, the last song on that album is I Can't Give Everything Away. I think, again, reflecting on what we've been talking about, it's just a, it's just a bit sad. <laughs> like <laughs> um, Talking about... Um, I can't give everything away, seeing more and feeling less. So like having the ability to see, um, to reflect more on his life with the knowledge and stuff that he'd built over that time, but he can't um, express it as much anymore. He's doing this while he's got liver cancer. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So I think, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about and it's an interesting idea to have an artist that could bookend their own life in this way Mm. and touch so many generations in so many different ways. Um, periods um, but ultimately yeah still under God like yeah. um, it's almost like a modern Ecclesiastes isn't it Braden yeah, it's exactly. like, like a lament of the frailty of the human condition yeah but he also that he, you do have that lament but you also have that celebration with songs like you mentioned um, like uh, Dollar Days where he's going back and he's celebrating the the, the his past but uh, ultimately there's nothing new under the sun, is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a, that was really cool. I think that's actually a really good way to finish. Mm. Thank you so much, guys. Especially thank you to the guys behind the desk, Dave and Braden, for being part of this today. Um, thank you to Tim. Thank you to Stu. Really appreciate it. I'm having a lot of fun with talking about David Bowie. I know mm. a lot more about David Bowie than I did before. So yeah, Well, thanks, Joel. It was a good, good way to interact with culture. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to do that next week, so that would be really exciting. Um, everyone listening or watching at home, at home or wherever you are listening or watching. We really appreciate your time um, and uh, thank you for listening to us talk about some interesting um, topics today. Uh, You can stay engaged with us if you like on the Discord channel, which we have, which is, uh, that'll be in the show notes. Uh, We're also, um, you can email me just at joel at shockabsorbit.com.au. We did just have a conference, but we're going to have more of those kind of things. So if you're interested in that, get in touch. Um, we will actually record that conference or we have recorded the conference I should say and um, we can, we'll can we be putting that out as well so you can always catch up on what, what we were talking about on that day um, having said that you can always check us out on YouTube or on a pod, your favourite podcast app but for now I think we will wrap it up by like we always like to do with a one way one way, one way. thank you Okay, so now he's gonna he's emerging from his little little oh, place of cute. sleep. Isn't he gorgeous? What a legend. <laughs>
Hey, little dude. Hello, man. Nope. Oh, oh that's a big yawn. Very nice. He's been asleep for hours. Super right? comfortable, but he's just yep. like, this is chill. <laughs> it's great. 